Tales with a Twist time. Yay. Happy Tales with a Twist. Uh, this is part of our awesome series. I'm going to go ahead now that I've figured out how to hide that, hide that. Probably put myself in a different spot here. There we go. Uh, and um, wanting to let you know that I've never read this story. And um, I don't even know if it's a good story. But I really, um, I think it must be because unlike all the other Tales of the Twist, I had to like hunt for this on the internet and then ended up having to check it out from that like internet archive site, which libraries have been mad at and like getting mad at. It's like, I don't know uh, how to say it, but basically there's some copyright issues maybe with this story. So that must mean it's good, right? It's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Um, but uh, it's, it's a cowboy story, which is not my usual genre um, that I've been reading to you guys of Tales of the Twist. So let's see what happens. It's called Gold Mounted Guns. And then, of course, we'll have the questions for you to answer uh, written in the journal entry uh, for today. So just look at the actual assignment for the questions because the questions are not in here um, like they sometimes are. Okay, so without further ado, I am ready to read um, this. It took me 15 minutes to find a copy of it uh, on the internet. Gold Mounted Guns by F.R. Buckley. Never even heard of this author. Um, so it'll be interesting uh, if anybody wants to research further. Okay. Evening had fallen on Longhorn City, and already to the south, an eager star was twinkling in the velvet sky when a spare hard-faced man slouched, slouched down the main street and selected a pony from the dozen hitched beside Tim Gagahan's general store. The town, which in the daytime suffered from an excess of eye-searing light in its open spaces, confined its efforts at artificial lighting to the one store, the one saloon, and its neighbor, the Temple of Chance. So it was from a dusky void that the hard-faced man heard himself called by name. Tommy, a subdued voice, accosted him. The hard-faced man made, it seemed, a very slight movement, a mere flick of the hand at his low-slung belt. We know what, uh, what that means in cowboy times, right? Good. But it was a movement perfectly appraised by the man in the shadows. And appraised is like knowing what the movement was intended to do. Wait a minute, the voice pleaded. A moment later, his hands upraised, his pony's bridle reins caught in the crook of one arm. A young man moved into the zone of light that shone bravely out through Tim Gonagan's back window. Don't shoot, he said. Uh, hold on, just a Don't shoot, he said, trying to control his nervousness before the weapon i'm making sure sorry guys i had to stop for a phone call uh, before the weapon unwaveringly trained on him i'm a friend for perhaps 15 seconds the newcomer and the hard-faced man examined each other with the unweaking scrutiny of those who take chances of life and death the younger with that lightning draw fresh in his mind noted the sinister droop of a gray mustache over a hidden mouth and shivered a little as his gaze met that of a pair of steel blue eyes the man with the gun saw before him a rather handsome face marred even in this moment of submission by a certain desperation what do you want he asked tersely can i put my hands down countered the other the lean man considered all things being equal he said i think i'd rather you'd first tell me how you got around to calling me tommy you've been asking people in the street no said the boy i only got into town this afternoon and i ain't a fool anyway i seen you riding this afternoon and the way folks backed away from you made me wonder who you was then I seen them gold mounted guns of yourn, and of course I knew. Nobody ever had guns like them, but Pico's Tommy. I could have shot you while you was getting your horse if I'd been that way inclined. The lean man bit his mustache. Put him down. What do you want? I want to join you. You want a what? Yeah, I know it sounds foolish to you, maybe, said the young man. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't do that one well, maybe. I'm trying to do Southern. Sorry, guys. Sounds foolish to you, maybe. <laughs> But listen, your side kicker's in jail down in Roswell. I figured I could take his place. Anyway, till he got out. So he's in prison. I know I ain't got any record, but I can ride and I can shoot the pips out of a 10 spot at 10 paces. And I got a little job to bring into the firm to start with. The lean man's gaze narrowed. Have a? Ha, ha, have you? I think that's what they mean. Have you? Yes, softly. 
It ain't anything like you go in for as a rule, said the boy apologetically, but it's a roll of cash, and I guess it'll show you I'm straight. I only got onto it this afternoon. Kind of providential I should meet you right now. The lean man chewed his mustache. His eyes did not shift. Yeah, he said slowly. What you quit and punching for? I'm sick of it. Okay. Figuring robbing trains is easier money? No, said the young man. I ain't, but I like a little spice in life. They ain't none in punching. Got a girl, asked the lean man. The boy shook his head. The hard-faced man nodded reflectively. What's the job, he asked. The light from Gogan's window was cut off by the body of a man who, cupping his hands about his eyes, stared out into the night like that, as if to locate the buzz of voices at the back of the store. If you're gonna take me on, said the young man, I can tell you why we're riding toward it. If you ain't, why well, there's no need to go no further. The elder slipped back into its holster the gold mounting gun he had drawn, glanced once at the obscured window, and again piercingly at the boy, whose face now showed white in the light of the rising moon. Then he turned his pony and mounted. Come on, he commanded. Five minutes later, the two had passed the limits of the town, heading for the low range of hills which encircled it to the south and Will Arblaster had given the details of his job to the unemotional man at his side. How do you know the old guy's got the money? Came a level question. I saw him coming out of the bank this afternoon, grinning all over his face and stuffing it in his pants pockets, said the boy. And when he is gone, I kind of inquired who he was. His name's Sanderson, and he lives in this year cabin right ahead a mile. Looked kind of a soft old geezer, kind of to give up without any trouble. Must have been quite some cash there, judging by the size of the roll, but I guess when you ask him for it, he won't mind letting it go. I ain't going to ask him, said the lean man. This is your job. The boy hesitated. Well, if I do it right, he asked with a trace of tremor in his voice, will you take me along with you for sure? Yeah, I'll take you along. The two ponies, oops, sorry guys. The two ponies uh, rounded a shoulder of the hill. Before the riders were loomed, before the riders were loomed in the moonlight, the dark shape of a cabin, its windows unlighted. So before the riders loomed in the moonlight, the dark shape of a cabin, its windows unlighted. The lean man chuckled. He's out. Will Arblaster swung off his horse. Maybe, he said, but likely the money ain't. He started off home, and if he's had to go out again, likely he's hid the money someplace. Folks know you're about. I'm going to see. Stealthily, he crept toward the house, and the moon went behind a cloud bank, and the darkness swallowed swallowed him. The lean man, sitting, his horse, sitting on his horse motionless, heard the rap of knuckles on the door, then a pause and the rattle of a latch. A moment later, there came the heavy thud of a shoulder against wood, a cracking sound, and a crash as the door went down. The lean man's lips tightened. From within the cabin came the noise of one stumbling over furniture, then the fitful fire of a match illumined the windows. In the quiet, out there in the night, the man on the horse, 20 yards away, could hear the clump clumping of the other's boots on the rough board floor and every rustle of the papers that he fumbled in his search. Another match scratched and sputtered, and then with a hoarse cry of triumph was flung down. Running feet padded across the short grass, and Will Arblaster drew up, panting. Got it, he gasped, the old fool. He put it in a tea canister right on the mantel shelf. Enough to choke a horse, feel it. The lean man, unemotional as ever, reached down and took the roll of money. Got another match, he asked. Willie struck one and panting, watched while his companion, moistening a thumb, ruffled through the bills. Fifty ten, said the lean man. Five hundred dollars. Guess I'll carry it. His cold blue eyes turned downward and focused again with piercing intention on the younger man's upturned face. The bills were stowed in a pocket of the belt right next to one of those gold-mounted guns, which earlier in the evening had covered Willie Ar um, Arblaster's heart. For a moment, the lean man's hand seemed to hesitate over its butt. Then, as Willie smiled and nodded, it moved away, and the match burned out. Let's get out of here, the younger urged, whereupon the hand which had hovered over the gun butt grasped Will Arblaster's shoulder. No, not yet, he said quietly. Not just yet. Get on your horse and set still a while. The young man mounted. What's the idea? Why, said the level voice at his right, this is a kind of novelty to me. Robin Trains, you got any you ain't got any chance to see results. Like this here's different. I figure this old guy will be back pretty soon. I'd like to see what he does when he finds his wad's gone. Ought to be amusing. Our blaster chuckled uncertainly. Uh, I mean, ain't he liable to... He can't see us, said the lean man with a certain new cheerfulness in his tone. And besides, he'll think we'd naturally be miles away. And besides that, we're mounted already. So, guy, yeah, y'all see what's going on. I don't think that's a smart decision, but anyway. What's that? whispered the young man, laying a hand on his companion's arm. The other listened. Probably him, he said. Now stay still. 
There were two riders, by their voices, a man and a girl. They were laughing as they approached the rear of the house, where roughly made of old boards to paw Sanderson's substitute for a stable. They put up the horses, and their words came clear to the ears of the listeners as they turned the corner of the building, walking toward the front door. I feel mean about it anyhow, said the girl's voice. You going on living here, Daddy, while... Tut, 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 said the old man. What's 500 to me? I ain't never had that much in a lump and shouldn't know what to do with it if I had. Besides, your Aunt Elviry didn't give it to you for nothing. If she wants to go to college, says she, let her prove it by working. I'll pay half, but she's got to pay the other half. Well, you worked, and where on earth did I put that key? There was a silence, broken by the grunts of the old man as he contorted himself in the search of his pockets, and then the girl spoke. The tone of her voice was the more terrible for the restraint she was putting on it. Daddy, the, the, did you leave the money in the house? Yeah, what is it? Cried the old man. Daddy, the door's broken down and there was a hoarse cry. Boot heels stumbled across the boards and again a match flared. Its pale light showed a girl standing in the doorway of the cabin, her hands clasped on her bosom, while beyond the wreckage of the door, a bent figure with silver hair tottered away from the mantel shelf. In one hand, Pa Sanderson held the flickering match, and in the other, a tin box. It's gone, he cried in his cracked voice. Gone. Willie Arblaster drew a breath through his teeth and moved uneasily in his saddle. Instantly, a lean, strong hand with a grip like steel fell on his wrist and grasped it. The man behind the hand chuckled. Listen, he said. Daddy, Daddy, don't take on... Please don't, came the girl's voice, itself trembling with repressed tears. There was a scrape of chair legs on the floor as she forced the old man into a seat by the fireplace. He hunched there, his face in his hands, while she struck a match and laid the flame to the wick of the lamp on the table. As it burned up, she went back to her father, knelt by him, and threw her arms about his neck. Now, now, she pleaded. Now, Daddy, it's all right. Don't take on so. It's all right. But he wouldn't be comforted. God, I would feel really, really freaking bad. <laughs> I can't replace it, cried pa, pa Sanderson, dropping trembling hands from his face. It's gone. Two years you've been away from me. From me. Two years you've slaved in a store. And now... Oh, hush, the girl begged. Now, Daddy, it's all right. I won't cry. Uh, I can go on working. And with a convulsive effort, the old man got to his feet. Two years more slavery while some skunk drinks your money and gambles it away and throws it away? He cried. Curse him. Whoever it is, curse him. Where is God's justice? What's a man going to believe when years of scraping like your aunt done? And you're, God is. And years of slaving like yours in Laredo there. And all our happiness today can be wiped out by a damn thief in a minute. The girl put her little hand over her father's mouth. Don't, Daddy, she choked. It only makes it worse. Come and lie down in your bed and I'll make you some coffee. Don't cry, Daddy, darling, please. Gently like a mother with a little child, she led the heartbroken old man out of the watcher's line of vision, out of the circle of lamplight. More faintly, but still with heart-rending distinctness, the listeners could hear the sounds of weeping. The lean man sniffed, chuckled, and pulled his bridle. Well, clearly not feeling a thing. <coughs> Some circus, he said appreciatively. So he's like amused by it, right? He said he never gets, he's bored. Like clearly this guy doesn't, doesn't have much of a conscience. Some circus, he said appreciatively. Come on, boy. His horse mewed a few paces, but Will Arblasters did not. The lean man turned in his saddle. Ain't you coming, he asked. For 10 seconds, perhaps the boy made no answer. Then he urged his pony forward until it stood side by side with his companions. No, he said, and I ain't going to take that money neither. Huh? The voice was slow and meditative. Don't know as ever I figured what this game meant, he said. Always seemed to me that all the hardships was on the stick up man's side, getting shot at and chased and so on. Kind of fun at that. I never thought about old men crying. That ain't my fault, said the lean man. No, said Will, Ar said Will Arblaster, still very slowly. But I'm going to take that money back. You didn't have no trouble getting it, so you don't lose nothing. <coughs> Ooh. Suppose I say I won't let go of it, suggested the lean man with a sneer. Then, snarled Arblaster, I'll blow your damn head off and take it. Don't you move, you. I got you covered. I'll take the money out myself. His revolver muzzle under his... His revolver muzzle under his companion's nose, he, uh, with the revolver muzzle under his companion's nose, he snapped open the pocket of the belt uh, and <clears throat> extracted the roll of bills. Then, regardless of a possible shot in the back, he swung off his horse and shambled with the mincing gait of the born horseman into the lighted doorway of the cabin. 
The lean man, unemotional as ever, sat perfectly still, looking alternately at the cloud-dappled sky and at the cabin, from which now came a murmur of voices harmonizing with a strange effect of joy to the half-heard bass of the night wind. It was a full 10 minutes before Will Arblaster reappeared in the doorway alone and made, while silhouetted against, silhouetted against the light, a quick movement of his hand across his eyes, then stumbled forward through the darkness toward his horse. <laughs> I'm sorry, said the boy as he mounted, but... I ain't, said the lean man quietly. What do you think I made you stay and watch for, you young fool? The boy made no reply. Suddenly the hair prickled on the back of his neck and his jaw fell. Say, he demanded hoarsely at last, ain't you Pico's Tommy? The lean man's answer was a short laugh. But you got his guns and the people in Long Order, I kind of fell back, the boy cried. If you ain't him, who are you? The moon had drifted from behind a cloud and flung a ray of light across the face of the lean man as he turned it, narrow-eyed toward our blaster. The pallid light picked out with terrible distinctness the grim lines of that face, emphasized the cluster of sun wrinkles about the corners of the piercing eyes, and marked as with underscoring black lines the long sweep of the fighting jaw. Why, said the lean man dryly, I'm the sheriff that killed him yesterday. Now let's be riding back. I love it. Awesome. So, tail with a twist. Uh, again, I'll have the questions in journal as well. But um, so, what was the twist? Obviously, um, I want you to explain that. Um, what Will went after, and and um, what the big twist right here is in the end. That's the beauty of tales of the twist. Um, also, how do you think it was better for the sheriff? to go through all of this as opposed to just arresting our blaster and saying you know i can't believe you were wanting to 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 commit a crime and rob and um so the sheriff sat back and let all of it happen um so what kind of risk did he take but also how was he able to convey his lesson better than if he had just said i'm taking you to jail um before you go down the wrong road of crime. Um, so, uh, like in Scared Straight, you know, when they like arrest people, but this guy, this sheriff did a different take on trying to teach uh, a guy a lesson um, about uh, living that kind of life. So uh, tell me what you thought of that um, and the risk he took. Uh, and then just tell me what you thought of the story overall, the use of dialogue to tell us about characterization, um, the use of the twist, um, the use of suspense. Uh, so just uh, discuss all of those things in your journal uh, and give me five to six sentences. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the story. Yay! Uh, and I will see you soon for more Tales with a Twist. Dun, dun, dun.